I was brought up in a middle class family, you know, like most of us were, I would imagine. My parents, they worked and they slaved, you know, to put me through college and, and to give me clothes and to give me cars and, and all the things in life that, that parents bestow upon their children because they love them so much. And being not really sensitive to, to other people's feelings, I spurned their love and I rejected my parents. I thought they were really, you know, old fashioned and they had some outdated ideas and I didn't agree with my parents and I just didn't get along with them. And I started going to college and that was kind of a drag. I went for three and a half years and I, and I was taking drugs at the same time and I was much more fascinated by what drugs had to offer than what school had to offer. It was a lot more exciting from, from what I was thinking at that time. And I was looking for spiritual truths through drugs and I was trying to find out worldly wisdom through going to school and neither one of them left me very happy and I was torn between the world and between spiritual things so I dropped out of school and I pursued my my interest in drugs and false religions and cults and things like that and that went on for a while and I got tired of taking drugs and I I thought I'd try some traveling so I traveled around the United States and, and I thought that that I could have real peace and real joy and real happiness if I went to the Hawaiian Islands and went out in the middle of a rainforest and ate bananas and just got away from all the people and all the smog and cars and, and everything. So I, I just jumped on a plane one night, just thought I'd go to Hawaii, and I got in the middle of a rainforest, 2,700 miles from my home, and I just started crying. I was just so lonely, and I didn't know what it was about. I, I was just at the bottom of a big pit. Like, there was nothing else that I hadn't tried in life that, that left me satisfied. And I, and I was just so lonely, just crying out for some kind of love or some kind of peace. And I came home about a week after I was there, and, and I just wandered around the beaches and, and just looked at people and watched the world as it was falling apart before my eyes, not really feeling a part of it, not feeling that I could do anything to help other people. For several months, I was just in a period of, of wondering what it was all about. And then I went up to Calvary Chapel once, this church in Costa Mesa, where it's a hippie church, supposedly. And I went up there and I saw just hundreds and hundreds of kids singing and rejoicing. And I sat down among the kids and, and they were all lifting their hands and they were just glorifying God. And, and I looked around and I thought, that there are a bunch of religious fanatics doing stuff like that. And they could tell I'd never been there before by the way I was looking at them. We're going to let John make a joyful noise to the Lord right now.
The ecologists tell us that man has about anywhere from 15 to 40 years left on the planet Earth. They say the world is coming to an end. According to a report made as a part of the congressional record in March the 11th, 1970 by Eddie Albert, man has just about done himself in as far as living on this planet Earth. He quotes certain men who have studied it as saying that we have 40 years left. He quotes others as saying we have 15 years left. What does it all mean as far as you and I are concerned? You know, the Bible is an amazing book. It's a book that, and the only book of religion, that places the whole credence upon its ability to prophesy and predict events before they ever take place. The Bible is full of prophecies and full of predictions. The amazing thing about the Bible is the tremendous accuracy of these prophecies, many of them made as much as 25, 2700 years ago, for instance, the prophet Daniel said in the last days, that is the last days of man, when the world is coming to an end, men will be going to and fro throughout the entire earth. An interesting prophecy that a hundred years ago had a very little likelihood of fulfillment. But a very strong Christian scientist by the name of Sir Isaac Watts made the prediction a little over a hundred years ago that the day will come when man will soon travel faster than 25 miles an hour. He made that prediction upon the basis that the only way man could go to and fro throughout the entire earth was to increase his mode and speed of travel above 25 miles an hour. Voltaire, the French atheist, on hearing of Sir Isaac Watt's statement, laughed and said, look what doddering idiots the Bible makes out of otherwise intelligent men. For Sir Isaac Watts is now predicting that men will someday be traveling faster than 25 miles an hour. And he said, any idiot knows that if you go faster than that, you'll die. Well, here we are. And men are going to and fro throughout the entire earth, just like it said. Though a hundred years ago, it was very unlikely of ever being fulfilled. But one of the most amazing prophecies has to do with the nation Israel and its rebirth. Actually, the prophets, all of them, insisted that in the last days there would be a rebirth of this little nation of Israel, that it would be born again and once again take its place as a nation on the face of the earth. For 2,000 years, that prophecy lay buried and people laughed at it, for in 1890, there were fewer than 10,000 Jews in all of the land of Palestine. But then there came the modern Zionist movement and the movement back towards Jerusalem and people weren't laughing quite so hard anymore. And then in May of 1948, all of a sudden we became very serious and very sober because there was born once again a nation, the nation Israel, among the nations of men. Any other Ethnic group has always lost its national identity after, at, at the most, five generations. But here were the Jews after 35 generations still maintaining their national identity and now going back and making themselves a home once again, even as the scripture said. But more interesting than that, the scripture said that when the Jews do go back and they become a nation once again, that they're going to be a burdensome stone to the nations that are around them, to Egypt and the others that would seek to do them harm, that they are going to really suffer for. But then it said that Russia is going to step in and align herself with Egypt, with Libya, with uh, the Arab states, with the Balkan states, and with East Germany, and that Russia is going to seek to drive the Israelites out of this land and make it a land again for the Arabs. Isn't that interesting? 2,500 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel told us all about what is shaping up today as Russia is beginning to pour materials and troops down into that portion of the world. According to the Bible, the next big event that's going to take place will be an invasion by Russia and these allied nations of this little land of Israel seeking to drive them out of the land. According to the Bible, this invasion by Russia is going to meet with disastrous results because Russia is going to be soundly defeated. Sounds preposterous, doesn't it? 
you won't have to wait long perhaps to find out how preposterous it really is. But the Bible says that five-sixths of this invading army will be destroyed. The Bible said it'll take them six months to bury the dead. The Bible says that they'll spend seven years consuming the loot and burning the materials of war that are left behind. Sounds rather preposterous, doesn't it? It also sounds preposterous, or it did at that time, that men would be going throughout the entire world. But these amazing events that the Bible has predicted with such accuracy are being fulfilled. Now, the Bible does say that the end of the world is coming. In fact, the Bible says that we are living in the last generation. Jesus said, when you see the fig tree bud forth, you know that summer is nigh, even know that my coming is at the doors. In fact, he said, I tell you the truth, the generation that sees the fig tree bud will not pass until all of these things be fulfilled. That generation that saw the rebirth of the nation Israel, for they are the fig tree in typology, we saw it begin to bud forth May 10th, 48. This generation will not pass until all of these things be fulfilled. You won't have much longer to wait to find out whether or not the Christians are a bunch of phonies or whether or not what they say is really true. It's all to wind up in your generation and you'll know the truth then. But what side of the truth will you be on when it takes place? It might be something that you ought to seriously contemplate and consider. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you're on his side, you're on the right side of the truth. On the next page, after where this fellow says, Jesus is real and living, and he can change an empty, dirty life and make it clean and full. Anyway, I see that and a lot more at the baptisms. What it's coming, what it's coming down to is Jesus is Lord. He's working in a mighty way by his spirit, and all you have to do is receive Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior, and he will do the rest. That's good advice, but let me tell you something. If you're going to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you better get a move on. Because just on the next page of the Daily Pilot, <laughs> there's an interesting article here that says, crisis, the crisis worsens and Israeli rushes to Washington. And then the article goes on to tell how that this past weekend, there has been a coalition of nations and Libya has joined with Egypt and Syria in a pact to drive the Jews out of Palestine. That is very interesting in the light of the fact that 2,400 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel said that Libya would be a part of this coalition of nations that would seek to drive Israel out just at the end time. Imagine that. The paper tonight tells you what Ezekiel told you 2,400 years ago. You say the Bible is outdated and outmoded? Think again, friend. It's as fresh as tonight's newspaper. Man, just tune in because we are getting close. We're getting close. You're on the way. And if we're still here, <laughs> then meet at Calvary Chapel for a big prayer meeting. <laughs> and we'll wait it out together. <laughs> Go up together in clouds of glory with our Lord. For behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye because this corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Ah, kids, happy days are just about here. <laughs> the end of smog. <laughs> School.
school. <laughs> ah, praise the Lord. Jesus told us, Jerusalem will be trodden under the foot of the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Jerusalem was trodden under the foot of the Gentiles for 2,000 years. But in 1967, it again became the property of Israel. And Jesus said, when these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. Friend, it's time that the church is looking up. The time of our redemption is so close. Paul said, now is our salvation nearer than when we be first believed. He said, now it is high time that we put off the works of darkness and put on the works of light and walk as children of the light now. It's time. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And he's knocking right now at your door tonight. Praise the Lord that he has waited this long. He is giving the final warning to the world and the warnings are coming in your nightly newspapers. God is telling you, time's about up, kids, get ready. Amos cried out in the Old Testament, prepare to meet your God. You know, preparation is necessary to meet God. You can't just meet God as you are. I wouldn't want to meet God just as I am with all of my sin. And I wouldn't want to stand before God except in Jesus Christ. That's the only way I want to face God. I want him to see me in his son, Jesus Christ, no other way. And thank God that's the way I'll be there. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. It's just about over. The time is just about drawing to an end. And Jesus once again is calling you tonight and saying, look, tonight is the night. This is your opportunity. Come in tonight and I will receive you and I'll give you fellowship, and I'll let you know my love, and I'll fill you with my spirit and with my power, and you can be one of these last day witnesses. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these warnings that you've put out all over the place. And what he said was really right on. It really hit my heart, and I could see that he knew something, and he had a lot of love, and I saw all the love that those people had in that church. And I wanted that. More than anything, I wanted that love, and I wanted to experience what those kids were experiencing. They had an altar call that night, and I stood up. I didn't know what it meant to stand up or get saved or anything, but I stood up, and I went forward, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And they gave me a Bible, and I went home, and not knowing what I should do, I went home and started getting loaded and reading the Gospel. And I felt weird about getting loaded. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't doing anything for me anymore. It was bringing me down. So a week after that, it was a Sunday morning, and I was standing in front of, the, of a picture I had in my bedroom of Jesus, and I was looking into his eyes, and I was smoking a number, and a tear started to form in his eye, and it rolled down his cheek. And I, it just really hit me. There was a, just a tremendous silence in my heart and just all around me and I heard this little voice speak to my heart and I know it was the Lord it said Bruce you don't need to smoke weed anymore you don't need to take drugs or do any of those things so I've given you the peace and the joy and the happiness that you've always wanted and it's free all you have to do is just receive it and all you have to do is just give it back to me and give it to your other brothers and sisters and from that day on I just I've just been following the Lord because he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I've just been, I've just been worshiping God. And I'm just so thankful to the Lord for, for how much he does love us, for, for dying for us and, and just making us new creatures and giving us a new birth. is baptized shall be saved.
So today we make the next step. You've already come forward to accept Jesus Christ. Today you make that next step of identification totally and completely with his death, with his burial, with his resurrection. The water is actually a symbol of the grave, the old life, all of the past to be buried here today. As you come up, it's in newness of life in Christ to live a whole new life that God has ordered and ordained for you. And so water baptism is a beautiful symbol of the burying of all the past, the renouncing, the burial, that I might now just really live totally, full on, completely for Jesus Christ. And so if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you may take the next step and be identified with him in the water of baptism. Praise the Lord. Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So as you come up out of the waters, just expect God's Spirit to come upon you and anoint you for that new life that he has for you. Because we're going to live now no longer by the power and the energy of the flesh, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, that new life that Christ has ordered that we should live.